All right. Hi, and welcome. Uh, this is Professor Nicole Gallucci. Uh, this is the first, first mini lecture uh, for the PS 101 summer course for St. Anselm College. Uh, if you are watching this as part of the course, hello again! I uh, hope you've already seen the welcome video by now, give you an idea of the structure of the course. Um, if you are watching this not as part of the course on YouTube, hello! I'll have a separate intro video to explain to you what this is all about. Um, before we delve into this week's topic, wanted to do a brief overview of what all of these videos are going to be about. Uh, this is a, uh, an online version of my Introduction to Astronomy course. Uh, and astronomy being such a big area of expertise, we won't be able to cover the whole universe and all of its intricate, weird parts. Um, but we will do an overview. Um, we will talk some about the planets in the solar system. Uh, hopefully you can see the uh, cursor pointing there. Um, we'll be talking about the stars in our galaxy, uh, galaxies in the universe, large-scale structure. We'll be talking about all of those things in between. Um, we have four major focus areas um, working through this course. The first one, which we'll start off with this week, is the night sky. And sometimes occasionally the daytime sky. But stuff in the sky, how it moves, how we observe it, um, what that means for us on Earth. Second part is a lot about fundamentals um, of physics. Don't be scared off by physics word. Um, we will talk about gravity. We will talk about measuring distances to things in the universe. All kinds of fun stuff like that. We'll talk a lot about the nature of light, since that is how we know what we know most of <laughs> astronomy in the universe. Uh, the information we get is, is from light. So we'll learn about the nature of light and how we can learn something's physical properties from the light it gives off. Uh, and then we will all talk about stars and galaxies and extrasolar planets and the universe and cosmology uh, and, and how we understand what we know about stars and galaxies and extrasolar planets and all that fun stuff. So starting off this week, this is week one, part one, observing the sky. Um, we're going to start uh, this if you're doing this along with the online course. Um, you should have read, or after this video, go read Reading One, um, which is a collection of links, uh, both from Wikibooks and uh, some other online sources, um, talking about this same material. And you will be doing that to prepare for Worksheet One, um, which will take you through each of these concepts uh, in more detail. So starting off, we're gonna start off by talking about the night sky and the positions of things in the sky. Um, if you're doing your observing project later this semester, uh, you'll get a little bit more familiarity with that uh, in person. Well, we're going to talk about a concept called the celestial sphere. Now, the celestial sphere is not a real physical sphere, as is shown in this picture here, um, but it is a concept that we use for mapping the directions of things in our sky, night sky, daytime, daytime sky. We can uh, imagine it as this, this sphere we're showing here. Uh, it's an imaginary sphere around the Earth, and we've plotted the positions of the sun and stars and moon and planets on that sphere to help us navigate the sky. So it doesn't tell us anything about distance. We'll get into that much later in the semester. Um, and uh, something to notice is that this sphere has a grid pattern, so we can create uh, a system of directions on this, on this sphere. Um, and the special path we'll get into later this week, this, this red line, which is the path of the sun through the celestial sphere. The celestial sphere itself is um, broken up into regions called constellations. Now, constellation also describes a picture, sort of an imaginary picture in the sky made up of a grouping of stars. So a constellation can either refer to the grouping of stars. Here we have um, a map showing the constellation Orion, pretty popular, well-known constellation. Um, but it can also mean the region around that constellation. And there are 88 of these regions that make up the celestial sphere. So uh, we can kind of, excuse me, 88 officially recognized constellations that make up this sphere. 
Um, so many of these constellations you get to check out if you get to do an observing opportunity outdoors this semester. Um, our um, patterns in the sky uh, that have come to us from different cultures um, with stories, uh, all of these stars that are visible to us with the naked eye. So we're not going to use that um, too much going forward except to recognize that there are some patterns we can use to trace how things go around the night sky. Um, what you see, you don't see a whole sphere around you. If you are standing on Earth somewhere, you probably see a sky above you and you can picture it looking like a dome or half of a sphere. So here you are standing on some location on Earth. Imagine this flat ground. See it a little bit better in the next slide. Um, everywhere where the ground meets the sky around your point of view is the horizon. And when you look straight up overhead, we call that par point the zenith. So you can um, determine what where things are in the sky based on those different points of reference that are local to you. And there are other reference points that depend on uh, where you are, <laughs> where you are on the earth, where you end up seeing them. So we're going to do a lot of examples for mid-latitudes northern hemisphere since uh, I am situated in New Hampshire, uh, where St. Anselm College is, um, and for a typical mid-latitude northern hemisphere observer, you see um, the north, you can trace the Earth's north pole up into the sky to a north celestial pole, <coughs> excuse me, and you can trace the Earth's equator up into the sky to make an equator promise we'll get into a little bit more of that later on when we talk about how things move but for now know that um, there is a pole that you see for those of us in the northern hemisphere it's the north celestial pole um, and that's going to affect how we see stars move throughout the night sky here's another picture showing you a flat horizon you are the observer at that dot zenith is overhead the horizon is where land or whatever land water meets sky um, around you you can talk about where an object is in the sky in reference to you using something called altitude and azimuth um, so zenith overhead horizons all around the meridian is a point that connects from north here's north in this case all the way across the, the sky it bisects the sky north to south and an, uh, excuse me, an object's altitude, and this is direction, but also it's called azimuth, are the two points of reference for finding the location of something in the sky. How high up is it above the horizon? That's your altitude. How far away from north is it? If you spin around, um, that's its azimuth or direction. When we're outside, if we are trying to discuss how big things are or how far away things are in the sky, can't really reasonably use linear distances. Um, if I saw two stars in the sky and I said, well, those are two inches apart. Well, is it two inches if you hold a ruler here? Is it two inches if you hold a ruler there? Is it two inches in reality? Obviously not. Um, so we tend to use a system of degrees, these angular measurements to determine how far away things are from each other. Um, as you know, a circle makes 360 degrees. So you can imagine a circle going through your sky. Um, you see you know, the top half of it above you and the bottom half would be below the ground. It's your 360 degrees. We do that in two dimensions. Um, and we can estimate distance using our hand. Uh, and this seems a little weird at first. I don't know how much of this is gonna be in the camera, but if you put your hand out at arm's length, um, this works out because if you have larger hands, you tend to have longer arms. And so <laughs> the larger hands further away from you, it makes about the same angular distance. Um, generally speaking, the width of your index finger is about one degree. The width of your hand outstretched is 20 degrees. A fist is 10 degrees. We can use that to say how far above the horizon something is or how far away two objects are from each other. 
again, really useful if you're outside trying to point things out to people in the night sky. Uh, a quick note of reference, this is a should be a review, um, but we are gonna use the terms latitude and longitude to talk about our positions on Earth. Latitude is how far you are north or south of the equator. Uh, I can only remember these because a latitude's like a ladder going up the planet, um, which distinguishes it from longitude, which is position east or west from a particular reference point, the prime meridian. Happens to run through a town called Greenwich, England. So uh, when we talk about our position on Earth, I'm going to use uh, a latitude and longitude. And latitude in particular is going to determine what the sky looks like to you, what the night sky looks like, what the sun's path looks like to you as we go forward. Um, so imagine you're uh, this very, very not to scale drawing showing this human standing on the earth at a particular position. Um, this flat line is their horizon. The North Pole is pointing up in this picture. So this person sees off at this angle uh, is where the North Pole is. There's a star there called Polaris. Their, uh, excuse me, Zenith is right overhead. Again, their horizon is at their feet. Uh, so you wanna play a little bit looking at these images uh, and looking at the images in your worksheet and see if you can um, connect what you see as a human standing on a planet um, with this idea of the celestial sphere and how that maps out what you see in the sky. Some highlights um, for you to look forward to and think about as you're working through this. Uh, the sky above can be modeled as the inside of a dome. Uh, the horizon determines what parts of the celestial sphere you can see at any given time. You can only see half of a sphere because uh, the ground, <laughs> the rest of the planet is in the way. And the location of the North Pole and the star at the North Pole depends on your latitude. Um, so you can go ahead with any of these. You can go ahead, pause this, work on that worksheet, come back to the video or watch all these parts together and then uh, do the whole worksheet at once. The next part, we're looking at motions in the sky. Uh, so after you've figured out how to tell where in the sky are these positions, these, these positions of these things, um, we're gonna look at how the night sky changes uh, throughout the course of, of one night or, or several hours. So again, we have this celestial sphere image. You can imagine uh, this going two ways. One way is that the sphere itself is uh, stationary and the Earth is spinning or rotating within it. Or you can imagine the Earth with you on it being still and the celestial sphere rotating around you. Sometimes it's useful. Even though we know Earth is not the center of the universe, everything doesn't revolve around us. Oopsie. Sometimes it's useful for uh, that, to take that perspective, to imagine how things are gonna be moving in the night sky. So that is, uh, so the rotation of the Earth is the reason why the sun appears to rise and set and the stars appears to rise and set. And we know generally stars rise in the east and set in the west. Uh, if you take a, of course my computer froze. If you take a uh, long exposure, I told you these are gonna be unedited. Uh, if you take a long exposure of what the stars do uh, over the course of some period of time, um, the stars will actually move throughout the sky. You've got to wait a while to see it. It happens very slowly, so if you just sit there and watch, you're not going to notice. But if you uh, set up a camera to leave the shutter open for a few minutes, a few hours, uh, you will see this in the photograph. And if you look outside, go back inside, come back out an hour or two later, you will have noticed a position change. So these trails are the light from the stars as they've moved across the photograph. Um, and uh, I'm not sure which direction is which in this particular photograph, but I'll say uh, as Earth rotates west to east, so the stars appear to go from east to west in our sky. It's particularly interesting to note uh, these stars are not going straight up in the east and coming straight down in the west, right? Um, for, for most of us, 
Uh, there are some stars that rise and set in the east and some that don't, and they might all take these weird curved trajectories. Trajectories, excuse me. So again, you're imagining this dome above you. It's really hard to show in a two-dimensional slide and worksheet. Um, but that dome, if you imagine yourself a stationary, the celestial sphere is spinning around uh, the north and south poles. So near that pole, at the location of that pole, so this is showing um, the north celestial pole. There is a star there called Polaris. If you run a camera for several hours and see how the stars move, uh, that star in the center, that Polaris, doesn't actually move but all the other stars are moving around it. Take a beach ball sometime and spin a beach ball in your hands or some other spherical object. The poles um, might be stationary and any other spot on that ball is going to make a circle whose size, the size of that circle it makes determines how, uh, is determined by how far it is from the pole. So if you watch the stars throughout the night, this is north, so this is north, and the left, to the left of the image is west, to the right of the image is east. Stars, so this star for example, this bright one showing here, has risen. And it'll keep going around this circle all the way around. Um, and then underneath where you can't see it until the next day when it starts over again. So some stars will rise in the east, set in the west. Some stars are so close to the pole so that from where you are located on Earth, they never actually set. They just go round and round. And then the pole star itself, um, for us here, uh, goes round and round. Again, this, determined, this is determined by your location on Earth. We are going to be focusing on mid-latitudes, and particularly in the north, uh, northern hemisphere, although it works the same if you flip it around for the southern hemisphere. Pretty much the same. So our view from Earth is that the stars near the North Celestial Pole are circumpolar and never set. Um, for us, again, here on in the Northern Hemisphere, in New Hampshire, uh, we there are some stars near the South Celestial Pole that we will never, ever see from this location. We have to travel somewhere further south uh, to ever see that part of the sky. And all the other, all the stars, uh, all the other stars, the non-circumpolar ones, as well as the sun, moon, and planets, which we'll talk about in a bit, appear to rise in the east and set in the west, all due to the Earth's location. So some highlights. Uh, Earth's rotation is responsible for the daily motions of the stars and everything else. Stars rise and set or circle around the pole, and they follow these circular paths in the night sky. So if you're doing the next section of the worksheet labeled motion, you'll be exploring that concept as well. All right, next, talk about seasonal stars. So that covers the motion of the stars uh, over the course of one day, uh, or a few hours, one night. Stars, um, you may already know, there are some stars that are considered winter stars or winter constellations, and some that are summer constellations or summer stars. Uh, why does the sky change with the seasons as well as changing throughout the night? So from last time, uh, since I gave a little love to the uh, Northern Hemisphere, I gotta give love to the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this is a time-lapse photograph of the South Celestial Pole uh, as seen from an observatory in Chile called ALMA. Um, and that, ro that rotation of the Earth, uh, that daily rotation of the Earth makes the stars appear to move, rise and set, or move around the sky. I, I paused myself when I said day, because I almost said 24 hours, and that's not quite right. Because the interesting thing is, Earth itself rotates once on its axis every 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.07 seconds. We can measure this with the rise and set of the stars. If you measure what time a star rises, uh, you know, or crosses overhead, uh, or the meridian, um, and time how long it takes for that star to go all the way around, you get 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.07 seconds. Those of us who are human uh, and live our lives by the sun, uh, we measure our day as 24 hours. So the time it takes there to rotate is slightly different from what we call a day. Why? Why is that? That's weird. We have to take into account the motion of the Earth around the sun. 
So while we're rotating on our little globe, that little globe is also orbiting around the sun once every 365-ish days. Now we can't see the stars in the daytime because they're dim and the sun's really bright, um, but if we could see the stars in the daytime, you could make a line of sight you know, through the sun to the patch of sky that it's in front of, um, say these, these constellations. So we're going to talk about that concept even though in reality we can't see these stars with our, our naked eye or even instruments because the sun is so bright. But you have to think of this um, in terms of all these moving parts. Um, this demo I do better in person because I can spin around and make myself dizzy and it looks cool, but I will probably kill myself if I try and do it on this chair. But I will show you this diagram um, and encourage you to, to look up uh, kinetic activity uh, for rotation. Um, so if you picture, this is very exaggerated, not to scale. Here's the Earth, here's the Sun, obviously not to scale. In the time it takes Earth to rotate once, so that's where that line is here, it's like tick, 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 goes all the way around. So it's pointing back up as far as this diagram is concerned. That is what takes 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.07 seconds. So tick, 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 we've spun all the way around. So if you were measuring the orientation of the Earth by a star way up here, we've gone all the way around. However, we've also moved in relation to the sun a little bit in that time. So the sun was overhead when we were facing that star, that dist oh, there's a distant star. Uh, distant star's really up top off the screen. Now we're facing distant star again, up top off the screen. The sun's over here. <laughs> hasn't crossed over yet. You have to spin a little bit more in order to face the sun or have the sun be overhead. These squares down here show you what the sky looks like over that time period. So if that star and the sun are lined up, sun's in front of the star, so you really couldn't see it, but you know it's there because you have a good map. 23 hours and 56 minutes and four seconds later, that star is at that meridian point again, hooray. Uh, but the sun hasn't made it yet. It takes another, what, three minutes, 56 seconds, some, some, some junk and change uh, to bring it back around such that the sun is in that spot. But now the star has moved over. So over the course of one day, the sun has changed its position compared to the background stars. Well, we define our lives by what the sun's doing so the stars appear to move a little bit every day. So this is the concept of something called sidereal day versus solar day. I will not make you memorize those words, but if you can describe, you know, sidereal day is stars go around and solar day is sun goes around from our point of view, um, you get the gist of it. But solar day, that's how we define our lives, that 24 hour cycle. So the length of a day uh, you have to be careful when saying length of a day, because if you're determining it, determining, excuse me, length of a day by the Earth's rotation, 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.07 seconds. If you determine the length of a day, like most of us do, it's 24 hours. Um, so just know that those are two related um, concepts. And that gets us to the understanding that stars move a little bit, I'm gonna go back one bit, with reference to the sun every day. So if it moves a little bit one day, and a little bit the next day, and a little bit the next day, and a little bit the next day, imagine what's going to start happening as you add on more and more days and maybe a month goes by. Hey, the sun is in a different position with respect to the background stars. The stars are shifted um, at night. You're gonna see different stars slowly every month, every season, every different part of the year. So the slight difference between the solar day and the sidereal day gives us why the stars slowly change from night to night. Again, it's not uh, an immediate difference. You may not notice from today versus tomorrow uh, because it's such a small difference, but over the course of a month, you're gonna notice different stars in the sky. Okay, so the last uh, topic in this mini lecture is about the ecliptic. 
uh, which is related to what we just talked about. Uh, the ecliptic um, is all in reference to the sun. So if you were, <coughs> excuse me, as this person did, take a picture of the sun's position in the sky. At the same time, every day, it will not be in the same place. It will be in a slightly different place. Particularly, some parts of the year it will appear higher in the sky, and some parts of the year it will appear lower in the sky. And that's going to have some pretty big consequences uh, for us here on Earth, which we'll talk about in the next section. The ecliptic is the path that the sun takes throughout the celestial sphere. So this is back to that celestial sphere image, all these red dots are showing the sun's position on the sphere on a different day. So it's in a slightly different position with respect to the background stars. Uh, and so it takes one year to make that path, that's the ecliptic. Um, so the ecliptic def is a definition for that path uh, due to that you know, four-ish minute difference between solar day and sidereal day. Uh, the constellations that the sun passes through over the year make up something called the zodiac. You've probably heard of these constellations. You've probably heard of the zodiac. Uh, if you've ever looked up your astrological sign in a magazine or online and read your horoscope, these are the constellations they're referencing. And I can break your heart by telling you your sign that you think you are is probably not your sign, but I'm going to save that for a later activity. Um, but these are the constellations like uh, Taurus and Virgo and Leo uh, and all of those signs. Those are the uh, zodiac signs that lie along the ecliptic. You'll be doing a little bit with those if you are working on the worksheet um, as well. So as the Earth orbits the sun, again, if we, we know in space Earth is orbiting the sun, sun is the bigger thing. We'll talk about gravity in a couple weeks. Um, but for now, if you imagine yourself on Earth looking out at the sky, what you see is the sun appears to move eastward a little bit every day along that ecliptic path and through those different constellations. So these symbols are just the symbols for the different constellations. If you're doing the worksheet, you have the actual constellations on the worksheet to play with. So the highlights for this is the ecliptic is the sun's path throughout the celestial sphere over the course of one year. The minor shift of the stars compared to the sun add up a little bit every day over time. Uh, and roughly once every month, the sun is in, or uh, you can draw a line of sight for the sun through to a particular constellation along uh, that ecliptic line. That's it for mini lecture number one. Uh, get to work on your worksheets, uh, and I'll see you on the discussion boards. Thanks.